how to uh, identify risk, right? That the topic we are and um, got kind of in depth on, before we even begin identifying risk, what kind of things needs to be in place to enable us I categorize and say, this is truly a risk, right? Uh, we also touch upon how you can have a thread, but if there is no um, likelihood of that, um, sorry, how you can have a vulnerability, if there's no likelihood of that vulnerability being exploited, then chances are you do not have a risk. I, um, yeah, I believe we touched on all of those. We also covered this part where I am right now on the screen. Uh, just a second. Okay, great. We touch on um, basically the methods of identifying the risk. We discussed what an asset is, what the threats could be. We touch upon um, identifying existing controls as well as identifying the vulnerabilities and including identifying the consequences, right? Which is what is the detrimental effect if something were to happen. We also discussed how the risk estimation process gets into the picture, meaning you, some call it the risk categorization, some call it the risk are uh, major, but it's just basically trying to put some form of a value or try to scale that risk, right? Be it calling it, oh, it's low, it's high, it's moderate, or you say, oh, this is 100% um, going to impact us. Maybe putting some percentage into it, but yes. We also touch upon how all of these are more information, but how do you get those information? We touch upon historical contents, looking into what has happened previously, what kind of, what are our experiences, right? Pretty much looking back to see what can we learn from that and then trying to gather those informations. Um, we also touch upon the systematic approach around expert opinions. Uh, this is where we bring in all of those SMEs, including consultants and whatsoever to help us identify those risks because they have really been baked into that sector in depth. Like you find someone who is um, a financial risk professional, for example, they've been doing it for ages. Obviously, they are able to kind of identify things that, you know, we might miss if we decide to do it by ourselves. And then they help us exam uh, examine the business process and identify basically the points of failure, right? I'm reading off the slide here, but um, yeah. Interviews is another process. We also talk about the theoretical analysis that is looking at, okay, how does this new technology maybe introduce a new type of risk or reviewing uh, kind of um, the points of attack. We also look at it from an assessment viewpoint, like we do a pen penetration testing. We also do vulnerability testing from infrastructure perspective, networking. At the end of the day, all of those things, we are looking for information that will help us end the risk. So, one interesting thing is, if we look at it, the entire landscape, we look at, say, the government, we look at um, the financial sector, the commercial sector, and all of those, we do understand the need to really identify risk. But do we expect risk to, say, the government be the same as for the financial sector from maybe cut issuance where PCI comes into the picture? No. Do we expect it to be the same for, say, um, health sector, where it's more related to data, um, data records, as well as like PIIs and all of those things. Maybe, maybe not. That is one of the reasons why we also have those kind of guides for risk classification, right? And we have a lot of those guides, but they are always tailored to a certain um, uh, industry or certain organization or even kind of, um, from a government perspective, it could be just a general guideline that is out there and basically the customers will pick it up to see if it's applicable to them. In this case where you look at like say the 800-39 that is out there by NIST, where the different agencies, you pick um, the defense, health, all of these civilian agencies, they can basically look into it and see if it helps them cl classify their risk. But then at the same time, DOD might have its own way of classifying risk. And guess what? Uh, they will even 
put a different kind of classification to it where the DOD might be calling it impact level, you know? Oh, okay, we have it as impact level two, impact level four, impact level five, impact level six, all of those things where we call it IELTS, or you find like the generic names calling it from low, moderate, and high. This, as part of also the risk management framework approach, classification, I wouldn't say it's the first thing, but it's usually at the early phase, because truthfully, uh, the first thing is learning to prepare, right? Learning to plan and also doing it beyond learning about it. Like really planning, identifying the key stakeholders, identifying those things that we mentioned and we constantly mention in the class. What's the value of doing this? What is, uh, how does it align with the uh, business? Before we even begin identifying the risk or even classifying it. Okay, um, so risk scenarios. I feel like we also touch upon this, right? Where we are talking about different um, business impacts and how can, uh, when we look at it from IT perspective, how can an action for, um, from an IT result will have, sorry, will, how can an impact from IT result into a business impact, right? So maybe a vulnerability that is IT related has been exploited and it really significantly impacted the IT sector, okay? But how does that translate into impacting the entire business as well? Uh, there are also those key identifiers that we need to be able to also come up with those scenarios, right? And another reason for having these scenarios is to help us really foresee if this were to happen, what would happen, right? If this catastrophe were to happen, how will it impact us? As such, we always need actors, right? Um, it could be an internal actor or an external actor. Due to time constraints, we are not going to dwell into defining these. I think the book has done a pretty good job, but consider an internal actor more of someone within your organization and an external actor could be someone from outside, right? But what's an example of a threat? Or what could be a threat? Malicious files, um, accidental things. They are also a threat. Like um, it could be due to negligence, but it's still an accident, meaning it wasn't intentional, but it's as a result of negligence, right? Errors could be, have an impact. Failures could be one. I, I think someone is in the chat. Okay, John. Um, Actually, you know what? I would like you to tell me, why do you think we should level the box as threat category? Because to me, threat category will not be from either malicious, uh, accidental, error, failure, natural, that you are talking about. Those, the category of threats will be more of the ranking. But I wanna hear your part. Sure, so I, I see both of these as kind of, you know, attributes of the threat, if you will. That is, you, you've got a threat actor that may be either an internal actor or an external actor. And then that threat actor uh, is gonna be related to a certain category or type of threat. And so the, the bullet items you're, you're showing there to me are, you know, not specific threats per se, but they're, they're more, you know, classes of, of threat that uh, that could occur, including, you know, natural ones. So, you know, like a specific natural threat would be like a tornado or a tsunami or a, or a uh, earthquake, right? So that's, that's all. I'm not, not, not a big deal. I just... No, 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 no. I actually agree with you 100%. I do have a follow-up question. Please uh, keep it short. Um, mm -hmm. Is your background in the government or another sector? These days, I do work in the federal government uh, in the United States Senate, yes, in cyber, but uh, previously I worked in the private sector. Oh, I see. The only reason why I um, highlight that is I 100% agree with you, only that I see them more as an element of threat, not necessarily category. Maybe I've been so ingrained within the government where whenever I hear of category, I relate it more with categorization and more from a ranking perspective. I don't know if there are fellow 
that got people in here that kind of understand where I'm coming from. But yes, in that case, I absolutely agree with you. Only that from a government perspective, I will say, like you mentioned, more of the class or actually more of um, the elements. But yes, in that case, right. yeah, I agree with you. Certainly right. agree with you. It will be my that gov that is influencing it. But yeah, uh, good point, by the way. And thanks for sharing. Um, next, we will look into events, right? What could be an event? All of this, it could be an interruption, the modification, theft obviously. Uh, destruction, as um, uh, John added from a natural perspective, is could be a tornado. A tornado, in, the, in this scenario, then the event is the tornado, right, uh, as well. Um, disclosure of uh, documentations or whatsoever. Now, we are still missing assets. What could be an asset? All of these things. Add, KFC recipe into that, that's all asset. But now we're looking at it more from an IT perspective. So I guess we'll start with the applications and infrastructure. We could add network uh, in there as well. They are all IT assets. <coughs> Not the like if we focus more on the IT, I think there are a lot, but they will all be more IT related. Obviously not looking at it from the entire uh, end to end uh, from the business, but yeah. These are an example of assets. If there's anyone who, if this is your first class in risk management or pretty much you getting the, the first hand of it again and you need a refresher on what an asset is, just consider it as the valuable resource that we are trying to protect. And please keep in mind and remember people, please, we want you to be a little bit kind hearted to your fellow employees and see them as an asset, not as disposable, right? Um, but yeah, they are your assets. Um, people are really actually um, a threat as well. Um, one of the major one actually from disgruntled employee. Uh, the book also laid those kind of things out, but I mean, um, disgruntled employee, all of those are, or even social engineering, those are all related to people as well. Uh, so I guess I'm now presenting how people can also be threats, right? Obviously time, um, time, it's quite important, especially around that estimation. I think we discuss, or rather I give an example with California, right? Where everybody keeps saying, Kali, there's this projection of, oh, in the next 400 years, it will be really underwater and all of those things, but it doesn't stop all of these, um, big techs to actually go there. Chances are it's because the time that they see the threat occurring is really insignificant at this point. So when we get to 99 years from now, then obviously, or even 90 years from now, it might be a big deal. I don't know, maybe some of us will be around to see it. I hope I'm not, but yeah. Um, <laughs> so we put all of these kind of um, different, uh, Elements, right, from actors, threat, events, assets, time, and pretty much mix them all in a bowl. And that's what we need to come up with our risk scenario. With taking all of these, I actually will open the floor and literally give someone a minute. Can someone please come up with an IT scenario, sorry, an IT risk scenario that you could, that will hit on each of these things that we present and say this could happen and by aligning it to this, these five elements. Any volunteer? I'll randomly call a name. <laughs> Anyone? Wow, you guys really pissed at me because uh, I said- I'll, I'll give it a stab. Ah, sure then, thanks. <laughs> All right, so just going from, you know, clockwise from left to right. Uh, let's say it's an internal actor, so it's an internal threat. It's malicious. The event is uh, disclosure. And the information disclosed relates to the um, organization of the enterprise itself, that is uh, maybe the org chart and, and telephone numbers of uh, people in the organization that might not be otherwise public. And the timing uh, is that it happens 
over a short period of time, uh, and it's actually a disgruntled uh, employee. It's trying to exfiltrate this information. Absolutely agree, and I think that's a perfect example. Truly agree with you. Um, absolutely. Um, I'll also add another one. It could be Ibrahim, I mean, literally uh, leveraging the example you just gave. Did I just say leveraging? I'm so much of a consultant. Anyway, um, using the example you just gave, I uh, would say, let's say Ibrahim is also working in a bank where um, I'm, I don't know, maybe a system administrator. And then um, again, I purposely decided to steal some records, just like you mentioned. And uh, not the org chat, I know I put in organizational, organizational structures in there, but let's say there is some sort of like, I don't know, a bank pro banking process, which is really the unique to that bank and it's what makes them efficient as such they have so much customers due to that process. So maybe it's a secret and I was able to steal it as Ibrahim and then uh, quickly they do that and um, there wasn't any detection mechanism that will instantly ensures that and I was able to pass it on to a competitor. That's an example of a risk scenario, right? And the truth is, I'm not sure if John, you were the one who spoke, but whoever it is, thanks. And uh, based on that example and the one I gave, as a risk professional, you constantly find yourself pretty much thinking ahead. What could happen? What if this happened? Uh, what are the chances of if we take this approach, it will resolve into something else? So that's part of the life, right? So Dr. Ibrahim, this is Stephanie. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so recently, I don't know, like recently, like during the summer, I took the malware analysis class, right? And I did my project on Wasted Locker, which is this ransomware that mm -hmm. they said that this evil core, which is Russian ha hackers launched on 31 American companies, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, I had seen, a couple months ago when I was doing my paper that they had hit um, Garmin, which is the GPS provider, right? Mm -hmm. So today in the mail, I get an email from Inova Healthcare System, right? Mm -hmm. And so I used to live in Virginia, mm -hmm. outside of DC, but I live in Dallas now. But Inova sent me this letter saying that they got that Blackbaud, which is a company that um, does some of their, um, they do charitable donations and stuff like they call people to donate money to charity and stuff like to Inova. Well, their system got hit by ransomware. And so Inova kind of let me know, okay, well, the system got hacked. These people have, they did the ransomware. They have access to your information, but just like your, your name, your phone number, your address, they didn't get any um, of your, like your PII, like your healthcare information or your financial information, which is like my credit card, right? And so like, like if you talk about this little scenario that you're talking about, right? This is like a perfect example, this ransomware attack that hit all these companies. Well, first of all, it shocked me because I knew that it hit 31 companies, but I didn't, I only had heard that it hit Garmin, but I'm thinking that they hit this blackboard system too that you know connects to the Inova, Inova system. But if we think about like this little risk scenario that you're talking about, and so like, if you wanted me to go through it, I can tell you like, it's an external actor. The threat is malicious. The event is, mm -hmm. you know, what is the event? Is it um, interruption is the event, right? Because they interrupted, you know, they can't access their system and stuff because of the ransomware. And they said Blackboard paid them, right? Paid the ransomware people yeah. to get access back to their system. But anyway, it's like interruption, mm -hmm. And then assets or resources, what would the asset or resource be? Would it be people or what? For something what like- What did they steal? Huh? What did they steal? Is it your information, including your personal, uh, like your PII around um, your social, maybe email, name, no, whatsoever, like, all of those things or what? So it stole my name, my address. That's what they said. It stole my name, my address, my date of birth, and phone number, right? But it mm -hmm. did not steal my healthcare yeah. information or my financial information, mm -hmm. like my credit card information, right? And so I don't, but, but mm -hmm. because the ransomware attack was on the Blackboard system, which contained my, Blackboard system, which had access to Inova, which has my information, would it be um, the asset slash resources? Would it be people? Because like I'm a person that's in that system 
or would it be the infrastructure? Mm -hmm. It could In be my both. Opinion, it could be this is uh, Jordan okay. Klein. That would definitely be PII because uh, having done reports and bopped around on the dark web and the deep web myself, as far as what you can sell about somebody, it doesn't have to be their social security number and a debit or credit card. It can simply be name and addresses that are good because ad companies will buy that for about 50 cents to a dollar a person. So if they're able to steal 200,000 <laughs> plus people's information, they could sell that to an ad company for two hundred, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000 even. So that outside of the money they that got. Actually, um, sorry, go ahead. Oh, so I was just thinking, that, outside of the money they, they got for the ransomware, they most definitely uh, sold that information to uh, to somebody, whether it be uh, like Chinese-based or Russian-based ad companies, et cetera, um, and made hand over fist, probably double what they made from the ransomware as well by selling all that personal information. So that is, you, like, you all have a good point. Sorry, go ahead, Stephanie. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 go so ahead, please. So like I, again, when I was doing the research earlier this summer on it, they said that um, this company who are these evil hackers, um, they charge between half a million dollars and $10 million for these companies to get, you know, access to their information back, right? So like, for instance, I know Garmin paid $10 million. It's like right out there on the internet that, you know, they, they, they got hit by the ransomware and they paid the $10 million ransom. Now, this company that I got the letter from, like, I know, but sent me the letter, but the company Blackbot that they use to do their ch um, charitable donations and stuff, I don't know how much they paid to get their information back. But again, if it's between 500000 and $10 million, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, so well, really, I uh, absolutely yeah. understand everything you are saying, and I also um, appreciate the other comments. By the way, sorry for uh, talking over you, but... Um, as you are talking about all of these, I am thinking of it from, as a risk professional, right? What is the next step? Uh, what are the chances of, oh, she keeps emphasizing that, oh, they did not steal the credit card information, they did not steal my social security number, but what are the probability that maybe you actually had an account with Target when the Target hack happened and your name was never shared, but your credit card information and address was shared? As such, then they can actually put the two and two together, or maybe they could even buy it, right? So a lot of scenarios here that we can basically come up with and so much to unpack. But the absolute truth is, what I, I guess what I'm trying to communicate here is, as a risk professional, there are so many avenues and so many scenarios we can come up with. Our guidance all the time, our guide is around how can we align it to that business that we are trying to help? How can we align it to adding value to whatever organization it is? So when you look at it now by telling me, okay, what is the asset in what was being stolen around you? Yes. Honestly speaking, it could be a lot of things. How, we don't even know the motivation of the actor. Chances are the actor actually really don't care about having your health um, like maybe your health group ID or maybe your health insurance record. They just need information of a name assigned to an address because chances are they bought this <laughs> huge data dump with so many credit card associated to address and there are no names associated to it. As such, we would like to just hack any US organization and see out of that, if we get the bunch of names with addresses, can we filter it and get at least some names associated with the address. Qualifier across the two data sets. Uh, as such, we cannot associate name to credit card numbers. So, so many scenarios. Again, I'm talking to you this from me coming from a technical background. I assure you someone who has no technical background, but it's also a risk professional might even see it from a law perspective, right? Uh, they might even see pretty much from the legal perspective as I was saying different scenarios to come up with. But I think that's an amazing example. Um, okay, uh, one important thing around uh, risk is every single time, and <laughs> we're going to get into something here where I will constantly, constantly, constantly disturb you 
on its importance, which is documentation. I'm basically due to the interest of time, I'm like giving my hand away. We will always, there will always be a need to document, right? However, before we even get to that, every single time we identify risk, we need to assign ownership. Ownership from who is responsible for responding to this risk. It could be the technical department, but still, even within the technical department, who is and who from an individualistic perspective? We can say, oh, Stephanie is responsible for ensuring this. Obviously, depending on the organizational approach, it could be assigned to a department where um, maybe the security uh, department and then the security department will begin their delegations, right? But no matter what, risk must be assigned to someone. There has to be some form of ownership because without ownership, we lose accountability and responsibility. So we put all of these scenarios. So many risks have uh, been identified or even with running all of these tools whatsoever, we have identified multiple risks and we said, oh, this could happen, this could happen, this could happen. Is that it? Is that the end of the conversation? Absolutely not. We definitely need to say this person or this unit or whatsoever is responsible for ensuring that this is no longer a thing. Respond to it, right? Or even accept it. We also have that part of the accountability. Again, as I mentioned, uh, for ensuring like somebody owns the risk. Now around responsibility is more pretty much getting your hands into it, right? The action part. If it's a technical one, who's going to sit behind the computer and fix it? If it's pretty much legal thing, who is going to really handle it? Um, do we need a lawyer to go present us, uh, represent us? Do we, all of those things around the responsibility, basically who's going to carry out the action, including who is going to update the risk register. Now risk register is an interesting <laughs> word here. Um, for those of you in the government, just think of a poem, basically. Uh, that's what a risk register is, right? Um, ISACA has an approach of having a single document where it captures the risk. It also documents how we responded to the risk. It also documents all of those things around what are the recommendations, similar to what a poem is in the government. Only that ISACA consolidate all of those into a single risk register. And that's what they call it. You will hardly see the word poem in the book, here, but that's basically what it is. So it's constantly, it's going to, it's usually, sorry, a live thing, a live document or whatever it is. If it's a system you're using some form of a GRC tool, like RC Archer or whatever is your risk register, sure, be it, sure. You constantly need to update it, right? Okay. What are certain things? By the way, I kind of just remember something on the, on the previous slide that talk about the actors, uh, the threats, as well as everything. The information contained within there is not pretty much all it, no. It's way beyond. It could be more, it could be less. Now, coming back to here, IT risk register. What do we need within an IT risk register? I'll be honest with you, a lot. It depends on the organization. It depends on what data is needed. It depends on what's being captured, but Again, this could be heavily influenced by my gov knowledge as well as the book, but at a very high level, you will want some form of a unique identification for each single risk where you're able to identify that risk. You can call it a name. Use the Star Wars characters if you want, if you know how to track it, right? I mean, we've seen it in <laughs> small, most times in small organizations, you find them naming their virtual machines with character names if the sysadmin, sysadmins love to play that fun. But um, from risk, I would advise that, but truly there has to be some form of a unique identifier, right? What is the risk ID? Within um, controls, within the that gov, you, especially around NIST controls, you find since we have the security controls all have their unique family as well as their unique numbers, they are sometimes used as the identifier so you talk AC1, there could only be one AC1. And if NIST ever want to update AC1 or withdraw it, it's not like they're going to replace it with another AC1, but rather it's just going to be withdrawn and then the number is no longer available. So that makes it an identifier. 
uh, obviously the description of the risk and who owns it. We just talked about ownership. Now interesting part, not everyone comes up with scenarios seen as we tend to, I'll be honest, it's a bad practice, truthfully, because we tend to approach risk from that compliance perspective, which we touched initially in the class. In the class. As such, it is not really a forward looking thing, but rather we tend to reply it from, <laughs> uh, Cleandra, I like the poem joke. And funny enough, I was in a meeting earlier that literally touched upon that. But anyway, um, you find like the approach is really not forward looking. So it's not really a scenario based, but rather we have an environment or we come up with something and we run these tools and the tool autom have automatically tell us like, hey, there's a risk. Uh, this is considered a risk. And I'll be honest with you, some of them are not even really a risk because once you start dissecting it, it's more of, okay, there is a vulnerability, but it doesn't translate into a risk because chances of it getting exploited is ridiculously high, right? Uh, sorry, low. Um, it might not ever happen. And I can give you a very good example. Let's say um, this is really high level. So if it touches on anyone's kind of field, please, please, please don't take it into pieces. I'm just giving a high level example. A laptop with no password that needs to be um, really secured, right? And only people with say clearance are allowed to have access. As such, we decide like, okay, you know what? We're just going to put a password and only cleared people will have access to that password. Then we come to uh, uh, implement the password and we realize like, huh, we can't. As such, we decided like, okay, uh, is that a risk? I mean, yeah, it is. But what if that device is meant to be a shared device and it is contained within a SCIF? We all know you need to be cleared to get into SCIF. We all know that the chances of an uncleared person getting into skip by themselves is highly unlikely. And we know that the device is meant to be shared. So it doesn't matter, be it like maybe a printer or whatever, it can basically be accessible to anybody, any cleared person should be able to see it. It could be maybe a timesheet or whatever, nothing sensitive that requires us to provide access from uh, individuals, right? From an individual perspective where we need to call it maybe logs that are associated with that person. No, we don't need that. We just need a device that only cleared professionals can access it. It could even be an educational thing or the overlay controls, for example, all of those things. Just because there is no password, is there a risk? Maybe if we can exploit it. I do agree it's a vulnerability, but here's what happens. You find a lot of these risk registers or poems that we are documenting just because of that, we instantly say like, yeah, we cannot implement a password on this device. So as such, there is a risk, we should address it. But truthfully, when we look at elements of risk, the chances of someone maybe exploiting that vulnerability is highly unlikely, right? And we touch upon likelihood. As such, without likelihood, do we have risk? No, we do have a vulnerability and acknowledge that, but it's not necessarily a risk. So risk register might contain a risk scenario. It might not because it has already identified, uh, it could be from that perspective of ident uh, the risk has already been identified, especially how it's done with like within programs. Um, the category of the risk, um, this is more around the ranking as well. So this is where I was kind of deliberating earlier, John, uh, to your point, where I wouldn't see it more as category because within, I know like <laughs> the .gov really see category as ranking, more of a ranking approach. Either it's low, moderate, high, IO, whatsoever, right? Um, the risk response, how are we choosing to respond to the risk? Are we transferring it? Are we implementing the right controls? Are we, all of those things. And who is responsible for actually doing the response? I could own the risk, but I am assigning the response to someone happens all the time. Uh, that's, you will find like maybe the CISO's office, the Chief Information Security Officer, their own unit um, will identify the risk. They are basically the ones also tracking it and all of that, but they will have to toss it like to maybe the sys admins in, that are within the CIO shop, that's the Chief Information Officer shop to actually respond to it, right? But then there will also be a need for them on the, um, 
response, but to document or rather write a description of how they are responding to it. So these are all types of information that are contained within dietary risk register, similar to a poem. As I mentioned earlier, this is not exhaustive and it's truly, truly just industry, sector, organization uh, kind of specific within the government itself. <laughs> like within at least the US government, I know it's super chaotic. You go into the DOD, even from how we are documenting it. Fedram have their template, DOD have their template, DOD also have a template for EMA separate. They also have a generic template. And even that you go to a the different departments and everybody have their own way of doing it, right? The more mature the department is, the more easier the template gets on how to track it. And some are just ripping others template online and just putting their brand to it and you look at it it makes zero sense like i'm not going to call agencies name but you find a lot of agencies going to fedram website and downloading templates from fedram and using it for their agencies which isn't necessarily applicable unless they tweak it but they don't really tweak it but then fedram is writing the templates for a customer sorry a cloud service provider like aws microsoft so it's not really government specific not gonna call a name in case there's anyone within those agencies, but we know them, they do that. Um, okay, uh, moving on, obviously the risk awareness, right? Everybody that is involved in that risk identification must be able to really communicate that risk. They need to understand it in detail from ground up. And here's one funny thing. Risk is actually one of those things, once it's been identified, that needs to be really communicated across, especially across leadership, for everybody to understand the severity as well as the impact. And it is not really that thing where, yeah, it's not really under my purview as such, I don't need to be up to date on it. No, with risk, so long as it affects the organization, I would say leadership, from a leadership perspective, everybody must at least be able to understand the impact if that risk were to be exploited, right? Um, obviously, as we mentioned, IT risk identified. Now, um, it says the enterprise recognizes and manage risk, the risk factors, risk impact, and risk controls. We all touch upon that, right? We will get in depth when we go into treating the risk. We will touch more into the risk controls as well as how we choose to respond to it. But everybody knows risk impact and we are, I believe, up to date on the factors. Okay, this brings us to the end of the slide. Just two minutes, please. Does anybody have any question on around risk identification before I get into the next slide, seeing as we have two other slides to actually go through uh, today? Open floor, anyone? Anybody has any experience, comment around risk identification? A funny story will be nice. I appreciate Claire Andres' joke of poem. For those of you who don't get it, I'm sorry. <laughs> but yeah, anyone? Let's keep it rolling like that, Jonathan. Okay then, uh, give me a second. Let's get into, seriously, if you're seeing my wallpaper, I'm not the lost soul. It's a video game, all right. <laughs> So we have identified the risk. Ah, Jonathan said, no one reads the poem. You know what? I 100% agree with you, or even better. Some of us, did I really put myself into it? Some like the idea of if it's difficult to implement, make it a poem, which is now complimenting Claire and Ross joke. Um, ah. <laughs> Make it a poem and then you find like, oh, we have implemented only 10% of the control and 90% of them are poems, but still, let's get an authorization for that. And when are we going to remediate the poems? Yeah, three years later when it's another cycle. Um, <laughs> but okay, um, so after the risk is identified, right, and documented, I think if I follow you guys in this chat, <laughs> we are going to be really distracted. Anyway, um, after the risk has been identified, obviously, and documented, documentation, documentation, documentation. No jokes, seriously. You will hear this a lot, and it's vital, it's super important. Please, please, please document. 
Like, even if you don't want to document due to the risk, please document for, just for CYA, you know? Because, yeah, just document. Um, but yeah, after that, then the next step is what? Getting into that risk assessment. What is the assessment? This is the part where it will complement that categorization where we're looking into how can we identify is the risk considered a big deal? Is it not a big deal? That's it, that's evaluating the risk, right? So wanted to just, oh, I should have just recap using this slide, but seeing as we just ended the risk identification, I think we're just gonna move forward, right? But the risk identification is more about evaluating the risk and the probabilities of it happening. Again, um, one thing I would say, especially, I believe I touched upon this, but that of ISACA, when I was reading the book, I found it to be even worse, truthfully, is you find so much overlap. Just be patient with it. You find so much overlap because you will now begin asking like, hey, didn't we just talk about um, what are the potential effects of risk in risk identification? Why am I seeing it in risk assessment? Honestly, just embrace it because it is not a one, two, three kind of process then. It's tr truly just chaotic. You just follow the process, but then you find different elements. Same thing with the ATO once we study, you will see it. You might get to the step three of the ATO trying to implement the controls and then realize like, huh, maybe we shouldn't have used this categorization level. Let's go back and take a look at it. So it's a back and forth thing. It's not really linear. Um, just an overview of this is going to help us identify and assess the risk, which we have already identified. Um, but then we're going to look into the techniques of assessing the risk, right? Ident now that we have identified the, the risk itself, how are we going to assess it? We will analyze some risk scenarios, as I just mentioned right now. Um, we literally just finished talking about scenarios, but you're seeing chapter two is going to touch upon it. You will see that also in the quiz, by the way, because you'll find like certain things are really easy. Like, huh, why am I seeing this in quiz two? Because it's a chapter one content. Truly, it's just all over the place. But yeah, um, if you remember in the previous chapter, we also touched about risk capacity, appetite, tolerance. You will see how all of those kind of uh, play a role during the assessment. Again, it also plays a role in the organizational culture because all the jokes we are cracking right now on, in chat around the, how we are approaching POEM and all of those things, they are all part of organizational culture, right? If you have a very serious and security aware scene leadership, I think some of the jokes in here, we might be able to, I don't know, I wouldn't make, I wouldn't say we find a way to get rid of it, but we might be, do a better job. All right, um, part of the objectives, we are going to pretty much identify the current state of controls. The reason why we are doing that is identifying and understanding where we are in terms of response helps us understand the gap as well as the asset, how we are assessing the risk, right? If what I just said confuses you, you will understand it in depth. Um, Jordan, I saw that I'm choosing, re you know what, I'm minimizing this chat. Um, <laughs> I just minimized it, so I'm no longer seeing the chat anymore. Um, yes, I just spoke about assessing um, the gaps between uh, where we are and um, where we're supposed to go, right? So that gap is what we need to either fill or at least respond to it from our risk perspective. Next is uh, communicate IT risk assessment results to the relevant stakeholders. Um, we touched in depth about communication and how it is very, very important for us risk professionals to really understand the audience and communicate to the audience using the language they understand, language from context, right? Good luck trying to educate as the board that have Chances are they don't even know how to configure their new iPhone. They need to give Apple. <laughs> uh, what do you call them? Apple Care or whatever. They might have to give them some money to really help them configure it. So good luck trying to explain to them what the impact of not having um, a web application firewall is, right? But still, we do need to find a way to communicate with them in order to be able to 
really be get the budget, assess the risk, understand how we are actually responding to, to the risk. So yeah, we need to be able to communicate IT risk assessment, um, including the result to relevant stakeholders. I think the result should not be there, at least for this chapter. We should uh, get rid of that in the slide. I will make a note of doing that. But yeah, we should find a way to communicate IT risk assessment to relevant stakeholders. If you're talking to, let me give an example. I mean, if you are within Google and you're talking to some VP of engineering, by all means, get into the different protocols and port numbers or whatsoever because they understand that. But good luck trying to talk to some VP of human resource telling them about port numbers. I think they're just going to shut the door on you. <laughs> um, yep, we need to understand uh, the relationship between the risk and the enterprise risk appetite and tolerance. So pretty much around that aligning that risk that we identified with the business objectives and the business uh, uh, needs, right? Especially around the appetite and tolerance, we touch upon it in the early chapter, but looking more into how much are we willing to really take upon, right? How much will, risk are we willing to allow? How much are we, I mean, if, if the risk is actually so much that we are actually willing to not take anything, it could basically change the business objectives. We've seen it done multiple times in certain situations where I'll give the tech industry an example. You find some, some of the tech industry getting into the tech side that is not really their specialty and uh, a lot of risk will present itself and they realize like, okay, this is not our playground. You know what? We're just going to sell this arm to <laughs> this uh, tech industry that is actually good at doing it or uh, whatsoever. I mean, it could be TikTok. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to seeing how uh, Walmart, I know Oracle is a part of it. Oracle, at least there is some tech uh, background to that, but I'm really looking forward to seeing how an organization like Walmart will run TikTok, right? A social media company. We, <laughs> they have zero um, previous uh, business model that have to do with social media, but here they are bidding for TikTok. So it will be an interesting thing. And, I'm not kidding when I said I'm actually looking forward to it. I really, really am looking forward to it. As bad as it sounds, sometimes I enjoy looking at the landscape because um, it provides that different perspective, right? Understanding like why is a place like Walmart getting into social media? Anyway, seems like I'm digressing a little bit. So what do you expect to get out of this chapter, obviously? Look into the information, you know, we use to respond to risk uh, in an appropriate manner. And this is key. I like this word, cost effective, especially if we're dealing with profit. I sound so much of a capitalist, but then I'm, hey, I'm in the US. So I guess it's fine. It's all about profit. Did I really make it as if the US is bad? Forgive me on that. Anyway, um, <laughs> risk assessment techniques, right? We have so many ways of really assessing risk. These are a lot of them. And guess what? There are more. All I can tell you is, I do not expect you to go read all of these, but uh, some of them will relate. You will understand them, especially like alarm bow tie. I don't know if people know the bow tie approach. I don't think people use that a lot anymore. Um, Cause and effect analysis is a common thing, checklist. Checklist, I'm not a big fan of checklist approach to risk assessment because it's really more on that compliance perspective where we have a standardized approach and then that's it. Okay, this checklist, do you have this in place? Yes, check. Do you have this in place? Sounds so much like a graveyard ship, right? Going through things and looking at it like, yeah, did they shut down the light? Yes, check. Did they do this? Um, so I really don't see checklists as a forward looking thing, but it's still applicable depending on the organization. Uh, I'm trying to see which one in there can people- Hey, Professor, to. quick question on that, right? So mm -hmm. I, I looked at these uh, techniques and a lot of them are very uh, involved, right? And I, I tend to agree with you about the checklist not being uh, deep enough, but in the lean perspective of where at least uh, the government's going, which one of these would you recommend to 
to support the agile framework because I would think that like Monte Carlo simulation and 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 others here would be too time consuming to support the agile any any thought on that real quick over 100% agree with you on that and I think you brought in an interesting topic even though I still agree with the business impact of, uh, analysis approach the government is taking but I will be honest it does not complement the agility that we keep saying we keep talking about uh, being agile agile but when you when you really look at the government from a microscope perspective it's more of a checklist approach not necessarily uh, a business impact hardly hardly do we uh i mean you do have to submit the bia document as part of like your ato and all of those things but honestly all we are doing is still following it from a checklist and here is a part where <laughs> i'm going to sound very pessimistic i really really do not have confidence in the government to be agile that is just the truth i think we will put the agile wrapper on our waterfall methodology. So many people within the .gov have been so much into the system that the idea of embracing new methodologies and also introducing chaos on uncertainty is not something they are comfortable with. And when you take like the agile methodology we are talking about, it's really moving forward without having an understanding of where you are heading to, you just have a clear understanding of what the end is, but there is no carved path on how to get there. Most people have been so much invested into their own ways, again, revolving around the organizational culture, where you're seeing like coming in to change how it is done is not really acceptable. I can tell you I'm seeing so much growth within DOD though especially by embracing the RMF and leaving the diacap. And also right now I'm seeing like Air Force is putting out this DevSecOps approach. I read the document and it's really presenting a risk assessment technique from a DevSecOps uh, perspective. So I'm looking forward to that, but I'm still for going with a business impact analysis. In the government, it will be more of the government, the agency's mission, right? In terms of how does the risk impact the agency's mission? Um, again, the government is its own world as such, <laughs> so many missions, so many focus, uh, we cannot standardize it. We really, really cannot standardize it. But I agree with you, we are doing so much checklist within the government, which is more compliance. Please, if anybody have, like if we have any authorizing official in this class or anyone who is like an ISSO, please, I wanna hear your angle. Cause that's a very good question, especially around the government side. Well, I I don't work for government, but you know, I work for a large telecommunications company who's been around for hundreds of hundred something years. You probably guess who that is, but it's the same. It's the same thing, basically. Mm -hmm. the, they say agile, 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 but the processes are so entrenched, and it's such a it's so much chaos that you really can't. It's it's a lot of lip service to agile. So that that's I thought was a very interesting question how you you asked it because. The reality is like the, 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 from a higher up, they say, do this, do make it agile, but to actually try to get something done in that manner is never, it well, never says big word. It's, it's much more difficult than just trying to get through the processes, which everyone already knows, you know, and, and that's, you know, and for the risk it's basically doing it the same way that we, everyone does it. So it's a very interesting, very interesting question. So thank you. This is Jonathan real quick. So I work with the uh, the Air Force uh, Chief Software Officer, Nick Shalane, right? Well, we oh, work Nick Shalane, side with some, yeah. Yeah, we work on nice. some projects together. And um, so I'm a security engineer by trade, and right now I'm an ISM for the Air Force. And uh, yeah, we're embracing DevSecOps into everything, right? So it's still that checklist methodology, um, but almost containerizing that, right? So when we have steps one through 10 done, it's containered. Yep. I 100, when I was mentioning earlier, I just didn't want to call name because obviously it's a class, but I guess I will since you opened the floor. When I was talking earlier that um, I appreciate the DOD's latest uh, uh, response to that methodology and embracing RMF and coming out with the DevSecOps, I was talking about the document that Nick Shalin authored that, is, that he is pushing to have it DOD-wide, which talks so yep. much about... Yep. Con um,
Did we lose you, Dr. Razir? Did we lose him? I think he got yeah, us out. Like it's it. really amazing how you are connecting with this uh, and uh, Ness really leveraging. I think we lost him. Hey, Dr. Waziri, we lost you for the last 30 seconds. I tell him in chat, but he's already gotten sick of me and minimized it, so. Maybe, maybe lost connectivity or something. I guess we lost class, eh? Who, uh, who asked the first question? Sorry, I missed that part. Which question was that? The BIA, the last question. Not I. It was a gentleman from Senate. No, I didn't ask that question. Hmm. So Jordan, how did everyone react when you came in with the pineapple? Um, it was a it was a relatively difficult sell because part of what I do professionally is I work freelance uh, as a consultant for um, a bunch of pen test groups here in Southern California and abroad that have trouble selling their um, basically their deployments to companies, and I'm kind of like the the shock value guy, so. Um, yeah, finance was there. The CFO was just, why do I need to invest this much to protect this data? That's way too much. That's going to cut into our Q3, for, you know, the usual rhetoric. Yeah. And, um, so they tapped me in. Luckily, it was a company, a big, big, big software development company right here in San Diego. And they said, you know, hey, can, can we tap you to go in there and uh, Hello, everyone. shock can it off? Welcome back. You're oh, back. I, I sincerely apologize. For some reason, the internet just went out. Technology. That's a risk. <laughs> That's a risk. Uh, but yeah, thanks for being patient. Let me share my screen again. Um, and we take it from there. But yeah. Um, we lost you at uh, Nick Shalane. That's where we lost Yeah, you. yeah. I will just say, like, I really appreciate how the effort that uh, is being put. And I really, really hope the entire DOD adopt that approach. Um, it's a really good start. Especially that DevSecOps uh, monster that Nick Shalin is authoring. Now, one of the reasons why I really appreciate it, a lot of us that are playing within the government area know that in as much as we keep talking about bacon and security, bacon and security, honestly, when you go through ATO, you just feel like you truly feel the delineation between <laughs> the development and authoring the document. It's like everybody treats RMF as this pain. Let's just find a way to just get, get it out of the way. Let's just alter the SSP. Let's just submit it. So I don't see it as RMF is actually influencing development. It's just more of, oh, there's this law, this law of this requirement that is just a bottleneck, especially if you are in consulting. You will relate to that more than being a full-time .gov person because from a consultant perspective, since consultants are usually the system, in, uh, consultants are usually the system integrators. Honestly, a lot of them treat RMF as just a hurdle. So what, uh, we've, uh, what we've started doing, Dr. Waziri, is we started integrating um, every product owner in that process mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. is responsible for their own uh, uh, security assessment plan as part of the RMF, right? Like the actual SETM. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So our developers create their own you know, evidence, essentially. Mm. I see. So, so it makes them ac accountable all the way through. So Dr. Waziri, this is mm -hmm. Stephanie. Did I pronounce your name correctly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, what, please call me Ibrahim if it's easier. I really don't care. Anyway, <laughs> <so>. <laughs> I, um, in 
meeting today and we were talking about that, right? About making cybersecurity in from the beginning, right? And so mm -hmm. even like I'm working on a project right now where we're trying to secure these two aircraft from the, the um, army, right? And so mm -hmm. our guidance is RMF, right? And so really like RMF, the purpose of that is for us to get to ATO, right? But how do mm -hmm. we use RMF to help um, kind of talk to the IPTs or the system owners about mm -hmm. integrating these requirements. I've been having a hard time with that at work, right? How do you implement cyber from the beginning, right? Like bake it in, right? Because uh, we know that- it's interesting question. Sorry, uh, please, please finish the question. Go ahead. So, because you know, we understand that it's important to bake that stuff in instead of trying to bolt it on, right? Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. how do you do that though? How do you do that? <laughs> Uh, seriously, you're asking the million dollar question because yeah. I always say this, in my viewpoint, and um, I don't know, I haven't compared with some of you, I wouldn't say I'm a, a veteran in RMF, but I would say I've had my fair share, especially across it. I have come to realize that truly our issues is not the lack of process or the policies or anything. We actually have some of the most amazing policies and implementation guide on a global scale. The issue is the people and the organizational culture, as we touched upon earlier. And this is me wearing my congressman hat. I gave you an example that I used to be with Deloitte. I found that seriously, it's the bureaucracy, it's the politics, it's just the people and the organizational culture. And the one way to get it done is truly, truly to identify those stakeholders. You mentioned system owners. If the system owner is the decision maker, then definitely you have to present it from a value perspective. And in that case, the value could be seriously identifying what works for that system administrator. Uh, sorry, what works for that um, system owner? Truly looking at it like, okay, why is this system owner presenting this um, challenge or not, or being very unwilling to allow us to use RMF as the defining guide of how things should be developed, which means we are baking in security, but rather they just wanna take it their own way and then we just sprinkle a little bit of the security from a compliance angle. So I think this is more of that people skill set. I'm not a good, I mean, I come from engineering background and uh, as such, I have my own fair share of aligning myself with other people, but I find from that consultant perspective, Truly, truly just the way to navigate it and get it done is that sometimes, I don't know, it's so the like, people thing. So I feel like RMF is just compliance, right? It's just about compliance. And so like we're, we, we're having a hard time because you know what, we've not secured any aviation systems, right? And we're trying to use this IP-based governance to secure these aviation systems, right? So we have a whole lot of work that we have to do, like coming up with some governance for aviation-based systems, right? Interesting. So, I'm sorry for complaining to you guys. No, 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 absolutely <laughs> fine. I mean, we are all sharing experience. I do know how uh, yeah. we touch upon how the class needs to move forward, but I honestly understand like what you guys are sharing and I hope other students also understand and leverage on that. Plus, if I were other people who actually um, don't know anything about RMF, this is a key point, like a key way of identifying who among the class actually know this in depth and uh, leverage them because they will come in handy in terms of mapping this. It's chaotic wrapping things around. So that's why I'm asking the question, because if there's anybody that can help me, I'd greatly appreciate it. <laughs> uh, I will put us up to so, that. I'm so, so sorry. Professor, I do not want us to bring yeah. work to class. I apologize. Yeah. As such, I will highly put us up to that. I uh, apologize, Stephanie, and do it publicly in front of everybody. But I will recommend identifying that person and connecting one-on-one -on -one offline and uh, not bringing work to the class, especially if... I don't know if, hey, it could be a risk, you know, there could be. Right. <laughs> so let's uh, yeah. try not to get carried away. Keep right. in mind that we are recording. Yeah. Prof Pro yeah? yeah. Professor, if I could just interject something here, because I think a, a part of that question um, could relate to uh, a situation where a firm, you know, enterprise 
or government agency is actually developing a product. In other words, they're writing software, they're building hardware, and they're developing something new. And then, and then the question of how do you build security in from the beginning is again relevant. Um, I've been working for the last six or seven years with uh, a model that I became aware of from some of my mm. earlier teaching, actually at the undergraduate level, uh, and I learned about this model developed by uh, Dr. Gary McGraw, who was the founder of Sigital, one of the foremost authorities on, on secure software development. Um, that company was sold to Synopsys, but there's a model, a longitudinal study model called BSEM that characterizes the practices of about 100 companies, including people like Chase Bank and that, that kind of company, you know, with very sensitive uh, security needs. Um, and this model has been going now for about a decade, and it has a wealth of excellent information on practices that organizations should be doing if they're developing products. In other words, how to write secure software and test it and, uh, and all that sort of thing. No, it's BSEM, Building Security and Maturity Model, and the 11th uh, iteration that just came out. So anyway, just share that. That's, that's oh. awesome. No, thanks for sharing the resource. I will please have uh, ask a request from you and actually everybody in the class. Uh, please, 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 if you have these kind of resources that will help others, including myself, uh, please put them in the class channel. It will be really helpful. Um, I don't know, Dave, can you, do you know if we have any discussion, like just a general discussion section? If we don't, we are going to create one. But seriously, this will be helpful. So thanks a lot for sharing. Thank you really very much. So, um, so at least I can assure you in this class, we are going to assess risk from a business impact analysis. Basically, if we are going through the NIST RMF, NIST RMF uses BIA as its approach for risk assessment. And we'll get our hands into it. We will get a template. We will basically leverage on all those information types and whatsoever to help us identify a business impact analysis. So if you're still lost with all this chaotic conversation we just finished having, I. I'm constantly assuring you, chances are the theoretical aspect is boring and uh, sounding all over the place for you. So be rest assured you will get your hands dirty, whether you like it or not. <laughs> all right. Um, so how do we analyze the risk scenarios? Now we have basically finished touching on um, those that assess we have identified how we are going to assess it and whatsoever, now looking into just this, analyzing it, right? Again, you will find like so much interchangeable. We just finished talking about it. There is the organizational structure that impacts it. There is the culture, just like the example Stephanie uh, gave in my own perspective. I was just basically narrowing down her challenge to really is not the process, it is the culture. But guess what? Someone might actually say, no, it is not the culture. It is the process. The process is not optimized, but still we are all mixing it into a single bowl, right? So all of those things, the organizational structure, the relationship between the management and the employees, the relationship between pretty much even the organization and the community. We, especially that of the organization and the community, we see it a lot. I mean, touch on the inter community. <laughs> I think this is pretty much part of a US culture now where uh, most people that I know within the government, they, are, they feel skeptical about the inter community, like, yeah, I don't want my data, blah, blah, blah. I don't want someone to be spying on me. All of those kind of things. They are part of the organizational culture or things that will impact it as well as looking at it from that, analyzing the risk, right? Uh, we touch upon blame culture when it comes to um, organizational cultures, right? We, we do not, I think that's one thing that I would say not necessarily one thing, but it's among the few things that across the board, it's really um, being agreed upon, like we should not adopt a blame culture, rather we should kind of have this feedback and continuous improvement culture because the blame culture really uh, it makes it hard to identify certain risk. That's just the truth. Even if you don't see it from a people perspective where like, okay, it's a, considered a, bit, a good character to be more open. Uh, when you try to analyze it from a risk perspective, I will, I mean, if I work for an organization and the culture in there is, is focused on truly blaming people, 
there is no way if I identify a risk I, that is due to my negligence, I'm going to go straight to it. I will find a way to make sure it doesn't impact me. Because guess what? That blame culture and going to um, be open about it is actually a risk to me because I might lose my job. So, and I think even risk professionals tend to look at themselves first, right? So, uh, so did I skip? Policies, standards, procedures, we pretty much touch upon that. We discuss policies, how they are foundations of the organizations, right? Like they basically declare management, senior management, uh, priorities, support, all of those things. It outlined, policies tend to outline the boundaries. Um, not going to spend so much cycle in explaining what policies are, but we have the high level policies, which focus on usually non-technical, it rarely changes. It's usually more like the law of the organization. And then we tend to have the functional policies, right? Which could be technical most times like, oh, the wireless, uh, bring your own devices policy. You're allowed to maybe bring your own devices and connect to the corporate network. Uh, you know what, we're going to change it now. It's no longer allowed to do that. So those, are, those functional policies tend to change very frequent, right? Again, please don't get married to these terminologies. Understand the concept, and I mean this in the most, I don't know, because I'm trying to find a way to let people know without it sounding as if I am saying like, ignore everything, but do not get married to these high level policies, functional policies, because guess what? This is ISACA's way of defining policies. If you go elsewhere, they will talk about the same thing, but they might not call it high level policies. Don't be surprised they call it oh, uh, managerial policies and technology policies. So focus on the content and let it drive the meaning. Uh, there is a reason, like when we go in depth into security controls, uh, people that have played within two sectors, I don't know, John, earlier, if you do, I can remember someone was saying like they don't play within the .gov, but before then they were playing in the private sector. So you find like you are constantly trying to find what is the mapping between NIST security controls and ISACA COVID-5 or PCI DSS. So there is one thing around RMF, that I found it's common across the board is the need to really align definitions, map it, align um, terminologies, the different types of control, all of those things, right? So then, um, okay, moving on, looking into architecture, right? It could be from a technical perspective where we're looking at single points of failures, we're looking at missing controls, redundant controls, all of those kind of things. We look at, um, technology from the availability of parts. And I kid you not by saying availability of parts, I'm kind of surprised how, um, how uh, availability of parts uh, actually started. But imagine, would you agree to buy, buy um, a device that you know is going to be, uh, we'll say, um, phased out, right? Decommissioned completely. And then there will be no more parts related to that device. As such, you are locked in with just a tool with no um, parts. Obviously not. So the ability to actually identify that and analyze it is also something. Compatibility. I don't know if it's on this class where I was given an example of, imagine an organization here where I'm being here in the US. US is heavy when it comes to iPhone. Uh, from a consumption perspective, iPhone is the major, um, a cell phone kind of device here in the US, but on a global scale, Android is. You look at maybe an organization is here uh, in the US, they have an iPhone, but then they need to open another brand. I think I gave an example, was, was it one of the Asian countries? I think I said India. Uh, they're trying to open a branch in India, for example. And now they just decided like, you know what, since Android is the most used device, let's just get Android for all the employees over there. But here's the one thing the organization communicates over iMessage and Android does not support that. That's a compatibility issue. So from a technology perspective, paying attention to all of those things are very effective, right? Again, there is no exhaustive checklist of this. Good thing I actually use the word checklist because trying to get away from that checklist approach. So for those who are starting in the field, I will say this. It's absolutely normal to feel like Oh crap, 
I will be unable to identify all of these. Nobody expects you to identify all the risk. <laughs> There's nothing like identifying all risk. All is non-existent when it comes to risk, right? So, but as time evolves, obviously, you will identify your niche of how you handle things. I can tell you within the .gov, a lot of us have adopted this mindset of, or rather I will say NIST has really influenced a, a lot of how we approach things, truthfully. Uh, the NIST documentations and seeing it from that compliance that Stephanie was mentioning earlier, checklist approach, even though it's said to be a business impact analysis, but the way we do it is more like a checklist. You go in, it says, we need these documents to be in place for you to have an ATO. So we need to have contingency plan. We need to have SSP. We need to have security uh, um, assessment report. We need to have PIE, all of these documents. And you are basically approaching RML from like, okay, do we have NIST ready? Yes, check mark, we are done with this. Do we have um, SSP ready? Yes. Do we have ITCP ready? So I'll be honest, we can kid ourselves or <laughs> make <laughs> say whatever we want, but NIST, the way NIST have kind of approached it has influenced so much the .gov industry to be more compliance perspective as well as this checklist. Hopefully things will turn around, but we'll see. All right, uh, controls. A lot around controls. Could be lack of documentation, could be, you know, you implement the control, but someone can bypass it. I don't know if some of you can remember, but uh, I know I did it. I used to be a sysadmin and truthfully, there were times when <laughs> an organization I was working with, they kind of blocked, you know, downloading music and whatsoever. But hey, as a sysadmin, sometimes uh, you have so many downtime. You just know, I mean, you change the URL and it resolves perfectly, right? So all of those things, how to bypass a control. Um, there are always cracks around. So ability to close as much as we can, obviously preferred, or even apply in the wrong control. But I can tell you another that I'm seeing so much that it is wasting so much money, especially around the government. God, I'm beginning to sound like I'm employed by the, the gov side of things and I feel like I'm criticizing the government a lot. Ignore that. Anyway, um, um, Actually, don't ignore that. It's one of the culture and the fun part of being aligned with the .gov, right? We move forward by criticizing. So I guess I am embracing the culture. But yeah, um, one thing I see that we do a lot is we have a control. The control provides all the capabilities we need, but then we'll also go out to buy another capability. Let me give you a clear example. We might spend some money to buy a firewall, maybe a Palo Alto firewall. Deploy it, it allows us to really implement all the access controls we need. It allows us at the network layer, the infrastructure, things like that, looking at it from that lower levels. It allows us to configure, um, yeah, the rule sets, like the access control list. So you define your policies, the firewall policies. But, so actually not but, it also allows you to implement application layer uh, rules, right? So you can have your firewall policies set to the application layer. So rather than seeing it from that um, lower level protocols from TCP, UDP, all of those uh, fancy protocols at the lower layer, and now seeing it from application layer protocols like HTTP and whatsoever, you can also filter based on that. One thing I see a lot of people do is embracing that the firewall maybe from Palo Alto is capable of actually doing the application layer filtering. Rather than embracing that or even exploring the possibility of leveraging on what it does, we go out and then buy another dedicated application layer firewall. Just, it could be because the Palo Alto firewall was never considered an application layer firewall. Or maybe when Palo Alto started, they were known to be just network layer thing. So getting into the application, Layer is more of a Palo Alto's maturity, but the industry have been so much ingrained into looking and in, uh, buying it from other places. So you find like it's becoming redundant, right? Or even not using it. 
it ended up dark. I am not trying to say it's justified, especially if you're taking up of it from taxpayers' money, but then um, it's a common thing we also do. However, I will say it's something if a risk professional is able to identify that, especially within the private sector and you turn it into a money value by showing what currently exists, it will make Just taking a post check here to make sure I don't lose people. Uh, you guys can still hear me, right? Uh -oh. It derailed a little. Yes. Yeah, it got, it got fuzzy. Yeah, you sounded robotic for a minute there. Oh, internet sucks. I can tell you I'm not at home. Uh, uh -huh. But uh, if you can you hear me clearly right now. now. Okay. I, now. Oh, great. All right. Uh, I hope it's, it stays uh, like this. Again, thank you for being patient. Technology. All right, getting into that state of control we keep talking about, what does that mean, right? So, um, you know what? I find doing this sometimes to be my best approach. So let me say, let's say, this is where, uh-oh, I'm trying to draw. And for some reason, it's not allowing me to draw. Interesting. So this is where we want to go, right? This is our final destination where we feel confident that yes, the risk has been taken care of, right? But we have identified the risk right here. And this is the control. The goal is to identify, do we really need to take it from here all the way to the end? Or do we already have a control that maybe close the gap by being here, uh, just a second, by being right here. So meaning at this point, we don't need to worry because the control has already covered this phase. As such, we are only going to look at this this is the gap that exists, right? What I mean by that is current state of control. So you identify the risk at this point and you're trying to get here. Knowing the current state of controls allows you to know where you are starting from in terms of responding to the risk. Do you begin finding a control mitigation technique all the way from where it's considered zero or do we already have tools in place that rather than doing the, I'm basically saying the same thing again, as, as, I guess, but rather than doing it from this point, the tool is already here or the control is already here. The only issue is that it is not sufficient enough. As such, we only add to this. So many ways of rationalizing this approach. One, it saves you money, obviously, because this has been already covered. Second, it's easier to manage and as well as easier to man, uh, implement if you think of it. It depends. By using the word easy, I feel like I'm simplifying it and up a lot. Um, there are instances where you might want to scrape this pre-existent and just do it afresh. It all depends, right? But the goal is to understand how far have we gone into treating it or do we need to start afresh? Now, let me give you an example. Very, very simple example. If I'm trying to think of something that everybody can relate to. Oh, perfect. Um, if we have, say, a requirement that says everybody must implement a two-factor authenticator, uh, a two-factor authentication mechanism before they are allowed to log into their device, right? Uh, it could be the, um, you know what, scratch that example. Let's use iPhone, for example. Let's say you have an iPhone. And there is this requirement that for you to be able to log into your iPhone, you need to use your um, thumbprint, like the thumbprint authentication, as well as in adding like your passcode, maybe just that six digit. So you need to do both to be able to access your iPhone. Implementing the control is doing both, setting up your passcode as well as doing the thumbprint. However, checking the state of the control to understand where we are, so we only add, could be you look into the, what implementation currently exists and you realize like, you know what? I've actually been using a passcode. I already have it in place. So what do I need to do now is just to add thumbprint as another authentication mechanism for me to, to be able to satisfy that requirement rather than actually doing it all over again. That is another 
importance in identifying the current state of controls. Another thing is really making sure that the controls are actually effective. That is, they are working as they are designed to, um, they are either implemented to function, right? It could be, we talk about right now with the iPhone I mentioned, the thumbprint. Now, how do we know that truly the thumbprint is do, it's working? Should we just rely on, you know, if I put my thumb and it works, that's it. As such, nobody can access my phone. Are we sure? What if truly the button <laughs> doesn't really work? It's just like it's been enabled and it's telling you it's been enabled. But every time you put your thumb, it's actually not scanning the uniqueness of the thumb, but rather it's just feeling the pressure and just enabling it. As such, another person can just come and put their thumb as well and allow access, right? So does that mean the control is not in place? It is in place. You have enabled that, but is it effective? Absolutely not. So these are all some few rationales around checking the current state of controls to enable us understand where we are beyond the risk identification and the risk assessment, right? Um, certain concerns, I think my example here has kind of covered a lot of these that you, um, well, yeah, I would say the example has touched on certain ones like misconfigured controls, very easy. We could implement a control, it shows that it is in place and everything, but chances are it's been misconfigured, right? Maybe we finish implementing the control, but then someone can bypass it. Um, lack of monitoring. Maybe the control is in place, but we are unable to really monitor the effectiveness of it or even monitor who can do what, right? Uh, some, that's some concerns around that as well. Wrong control, what are the chances of us applying the wrong thing? Yeah, it might fit in, but is it really the right thing? No, ability to bypass the control, we touch upon that. Lack of documentation, again, let me give you an example. What are the probability of me being a system admin? Actually, I wouldn't even say the probability. Do you see the risk or at least the vulnerability in me being a system admin for an organization, I'm the one who configured all their devices, set up their virtual machines, set up their infrastructure. I have their passwords. They, nobody knows the password. I put everything just in my head. No password manager. FYI, I'm not going to recommend sticky notes, you know? <laughs> but yeah, there is no password manager whatsoever. So I'm pretty much the only authoritative source of what that, those passwords are stepped out to get lunch, got hit by the bus, and I'm no longer an employee of that organization. That's truly, truly messed up because that's a single point of failure. Only one person knows the password. As such, does that mean they cannot access their devices? If we had documentation in place, that could have mitigated that. Even better, if we have a policy that actually identifies how we should be generating passwords, meaning we shall not come up with passwords by ourselves as a system admin, but rather go use this organizational password manager to generate the password and the tool automatically saves it. That's even better, right? Okay. Um, That's true, doctor. It's not even good for uh, a precaution for single mission and unifying the processes and standards so mm -hmm. all system admins can follow a unique process or standard so everything will be according to a certain documentation. I agree. And truthfully, if we're looking at it from a password, my recommendation will be one, highly if it comes to deciding on a password, is not to document it from how we do it, that NIST approach of have this many characters and well, truthfully, NIST also doesn't, like organizations do not define it that way, but we do put a limitation on the number of characters. Like, yeah, I make it 12 characters, and then there should be a combination of uh, numbers, words, whatsoever. I think the best will be to say, use a password generator or go to a site that will literally randomly generate those passwords. And that, the key thing here is the randomization, right? So long as it's not predictable, that's fine. But the minute you start saying, yeah, there must be three 
alphabets, two numbers, one special character, 12 days, then it starts becoming into that predictable uh, phase of where it could be easily brute forced, right? So around password, I agree with you on that. Uh, we shouldn't have a single way of it, but we shall still have a policy that says we should follow this method to generate it. Okay, um, categories of control. I think this is kind of really straightforward around, this is not only an IT thing, honestly, or even our server is just around risk. We have the preventive, deterrent, directive, detective, corrective, compensating. What's an example of a preventive mechanism? It, just a preventive. It doesn't have to do with IT or whatsoever. What's an example? Anybody, just one word and just let's move on. Something that prevents, I'm sorry? A fence. Fire a fence? A gate. Yep, all of those, I agree, fence. Fire Fire or lights. I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, lights, that's debatable. Uh, no, like, no, the IR, the infrared oh, at the doors okay. when they cross the, when they cross a okay. line for an entry to an office or to that's a more detective. Yep. Uh, detective then, yeah. yeah, that's more of a detective because I don't see an infrared light that first it's not even solid, it can't stop me unless it has some, you know, laser beam attached to it that kind of will slice me in parts. We don't hope for that, but yeah. Okay, um, so yeah, I'll definitely say I are a more detective. I'm oh, sorry, I thought you asked about detective. I, I, no, no, I'm no, I was curious. talking about the first one, uh, the preventive, my bad on that. Uh, um, hey, I'm, I'm blaming the network, that's why. <laughs> but yeah, um, talking about preventive. So yeah, I agree with uh, firewalls, definitely war in itself, fence, all of those things that can, if we're talking at it from a case club perspective, anything that will stop you from doing something, right? Deterrent. Any example? Hello? Dog, policeman. Camera. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Cameras. Cool. Dog, dog, that's my favorite. Yeah, dogs are definitely a deterrent. Hey, in certain cases, if it has to do with me as Ibrahim, I assure you dogs can be preventive. Because the minute I see them in there, I'm not even going to go close. They are not just deterring me or anything. Chances are I might run away. But I don't think it applies. I don't think it applies. Trying to make uh, make it. I think it's still more deterrent, right? Um, directive. Anyone? Policies. Yeah. Yeah. Policies. One hundred percent agree. Policies. Anything that is more instructional, right? Don't do this. That's a directive, right? Uh, do not enter this military base. Keep off. Uh. uh Aliens live here, do not enter. That's a nice one. <laughs> um, what, I actually have um, this uh, in my office at home. The sign of my door is more around um, nuclear, right? Bio opens in here, do not enter. So those are all the <laughs> directive uh, they could work, as well as policies, those documentations. Detective, anyone? We just touched on IR. Yep, alarm. Logging. Yep. Corrective. Anyone? What would be an example of a corrective uh, control? Corrective could be when you have a door that the lock mm -hmm. doesn't work. So either it saves as locked or unlocked. Depends on, you know, if there's a human, it will, it will, it will correct the action by just unlocking the door, you know? Absolutely. To make sure life comes first, you know, and like, if it's no human involved, just documentation, it will just as a corrective, just lock the door until someone else can, can fix it. Yes, there's a thin line in and, your and example a, around preventive and corrective, because I tend to see corrective controls more on something has happened and then they take an action. But I do agree with you because I can see also yeah. a use case of what you just gave where you know, it could be an example would be fire happens in a building and as such the door automatically let itself open, right? Uh, so people can go out. Uh, that could be it. But yeah, I agree. Someone was trying to say something, please go for yeah, it. Yeah, Professor, another, another one would be, an, uh, for example, a forward error correcting code uh, for you know, long distance communications like you know, uh, satellite communication. 
uh, to correct errors that might be introduced during the transmission of a signal. Absolutely, absolutely, 100% agree with you. More around that quality of service, right? The QoS we keep talking about, where an example is literally right now. If I were on a 5G network, assuming like uh, the way maybe I keep going in and out, we should have some form of mechanism with like 5G, that's one of the features, quality of service, really putting all those bandwidths towards Zoom that we are having right now to ensure it's taking it from all other places automatically and prioritizing Zoom, right? So yes, I agree with you in that optimization angle. All right. What, um, about, what about something as common as password reset? Password reset? Where it corrective? Yeah. Because password reset, if it prompts you to, hey, do this, I don't know. I would say it's more of a directive because let's say your password uh, expires in 60 days, your password expires and now you have it this, reset your password. I feel like it's more directive, not, but I'm trying to see if I can see. Could it, could it be corrective it, if it yeah. was uh, do, detected through a, as a result of a breach, forcing on the reset? So uh, the, the, the corrective part of it, I will see it will be more on fault tolerance, right? Where you try to brute force it multiple times and it automatically lock itself. The locking itself mechanism will be the corrective action, I guess. Does but that it's make sense? still directive though, right? Because that would be in the policy, right? The policy states that, you know, the password length, how many times you get to um, fail and, you know, before you have to get locked out, right? That's all policy driven. So the policy driven part, I agree, absolutely. I guess I got carried away thinking of it from that technical angle. But yeah, um, let's get on to the last one, compensate and control. Anyone? And I'm trying to kind of get this slide I would done. Say like, if you I'm sorry? Forget your, it's like you forget your ID to come into the, to the skip. There is a visitor uh, badge, hmm. I mean, an, 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 an alternative badge but has to be escorted by the security officer making sure that uh, you are vetted to, to come in so you can use that visitor badge and go in. It's a compensation, it's like, it's like a temporary control until the issue get resolved. Okay, uh, the last thing you mentioned is actually what I 100% uh, kind of made me instantly connect with it, yes having something maybe it could be as a temporary mechanism until the main thing gets resolved. I agree with that as the compensating. Certainly agree with that example. Anyone? Any additional one, just one? Trying to see if we can um, get this slide, just finish with this slide and then give people some break. I know uh, from the look of things, we will not be able to hit the other slide uh, PowerPoint today, but I apologize. Anyway, any last one here? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. Um, compensating, truthfully, as uh, I, I'm not sure who spoke, but truly uh, we have identified this is the control and in this current time, we are unable to really do that. So we are implementing an alternative, right? That could be a compensating. Um, but then we do need to measure it. Measure what its effectiveness, right? Is the control really working as we uh, we uh, expect it to be. I want to touch on something because I know we are constantly talking about control, control. For those of you who are still new to the class, um, new to this RMF, you keep hearing the word control, control. I want you to, for the sake of risk management only, associate control as kind of response to a risk, basically. Because you keep hearing the word thrown out, thrown out all over the place. Just keep in mind that we put controls in place to respond to a risk. If this is what I just mentioned. Right? I'm sorry, just a second. Um, please, please, please. Hello, can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? Yeah, yeah we can hear you. You're just bringing it up for a second. Oh, sorry about that. But yeah, I was saying like, if 
you find it like the control if what i just mentioned right now is so hard to kind of wrap things around please 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 feel free to reach out to me so we discuss it at a very granular uh, level the reason for that is there is so much importance put upon control because that is considered how we resolve things as such you will keep hearing about control wherever you are you go relating to risk management know that control is the way we live. not the only way we can ignore the risk but still that ignoring is also applying a control um all right how do we measure the control these are just a lot of ways right audit logs we are collected uh, we are collecting logs business continuity plan disaster recovery plan that's what drp means uh, i should have written the bcp instead of a drp and there's a clear difference between what is the dcp uh sorry bcp and the drp don't worry about it at this phase we will touch at a granular level in the future on what these are cmm mod cmm models earlier someone gave another cmm in this class that kind of helped us we will discuss what cmms are in granular detail incident reports i think we all have an idea on what an incident is from a definition perspective those reports the only thing with incident reports if you re remember earlier we were talking about those uh metrics around um risk identification or whatsoever and we mentioned the information part and we talk about historical things right so with incident reports it slowly start becoming more of a historical thing not necessarily a forward looking but backward looking into what happened right we are analyzing the incidents right but still it's a way of measuring the control uh hey even from customer service you could basically look at how many incidents did we have <laughs> this week then that's a way of we are really progressing and if you think it's a bad measuring way i kid you not the faa that's the lr regulation blah 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 right um the lr regulation is it the federal Air aviation authority that's the faa right mm -hmm. they actually rank airlines based on how many incident did the airline had within a month every month every airline submits an incident report from a customer relation perspective from sitting in the tarmac for a prolonged area from dealing with all of these from mechanical issue to whatsoever and faa tend to rank them based on that so that's ranking truly based on incident reports um oh it helps a control that is already in place okay um operations and management evaluation risk, uh, architecture assessment vulnerability assessment and penetration test that's for us in tech are uh, heavy ingrained in that security engineering realm like pen test it's definitely one way of identifying vulnerabilities but guess what it also allows us to know the state of our controls we measure the controls that are in place because if a control is in place or effective then you wouldn't have a finding right if you have two factor authenticate well nessus doesn't do that but if you already have tls certificates in place nessus will not report tls 1.2 or 1.3 missing right so that's a way to measure as well third party assessments external audits any consultant in the house i don't know i feel like i have the right of way to pick on consultants being one so yes any consultant in the house deloitte kpmg booz allen uh, accenture i don't know if accenture are considered um, auditors but yeah that's a third party assessment um from the federal side of things and just the general uh nice we have places like cofire kratos those are all external auditors right but that external assessment is a way of measuring uh where we are compliance verification all of those things i yep so should we take in the interest of time and see where we are we are a little bit back can we take just five minutes this time around and be back at 8 25 please is that okay with everybody sounds good 
please be back on time because we are not going to really give that buffer. So now, one key thing is change in the risk environment. What does that mean? Now, <clears throat> when we look at the risk environment, we know that not just even the risk environment, basically everything changes, right? Nothing is meant to be just it. That's it. The environment, us, humans, everything, right? The landscape changes, so does risk. And as organizations and technologies continuously to change and evolve, we constantly have different threat agents and kind of presenting new attack surface, right? Uh, God, I'm such a security kind of word, attack surface. But basically areas of, new areas of attack, if that works. Um, these are all results as a result of a change in an environment. So as a risk professional, what kind of things do you think will prevent a threat to your organization or even a risk to your organization from, as a result of changes, right? Uh, it could be trying to basically merge with another organization because by doing that, you're not inheriting their risk and bringing in nuances that you are actually not familiar with. Um, a lot of things. Uh, from a risk, risk professional perspective when doing things, I think the major ones are kind of, I would say common for lack of a better word, which is, yeah, we are now merging with this major organization as such. Let's look at what um, risk um, is within the industry and make sure we are comfortable with it. Or we are looking at threats from, like I gave an example with, with California. All of those risk identification, they are common, I would say, for a risk, a seasoned risk professional to look into those places. Other places that we are now seeing huge and drastic change with, especially with technology, are around emerging technologies, right? Constantly, we know that, and you will keep hearing it, that security is constantly trying to catch up with technology. We cannot define that. Uh, we cannot deny the fact that the technology landscape is going at a very fast pace. Uh, that's most law, right? Please, someone correct me where they were, there was this kind of um, saying around things will be uh, multiplied. I think it was yeah. more towards processors. It's most law, right? 16 months that the Sorry. area for a chip would double. And it's actually shown to be around 12 to 14 historically. Exactly. So truly like the, yeah, thank you. Um, so truly there is so much evolution and it's continuously. And as such, we are constantly seeing new technologies in the market. We are constantly being faced with pressure to implement new technology, right? Which is usually often influenced. That pressure is usually coming from some form of inflated expectations or some form of maturity or some sort of trying to compete within the industry. It could be product functionality. It could actually be from a security perspective. Um, it could be now we have, uh, I mean, a, Good example is we have come uh, quantum computing. They are no longer a dream. It's we actually do have them. You look at it from the government side. Look at uh, I think Lockheed Martin managed the DoD quantum computers. Uh, all of those things. So <laughs> the minute we start looking at having our portable devices from your laptops and whatsoever at the same speed rate with quantum devices. I am telling you all of our encryption algorithms are just trashed. So as such, I will say the majority of the conventional security algorithms will literally be meaningless because with that amount of speed, it takes a less amount of time to really break them. Keeping in mind that most, <laughs> not even most, there is nothing like an unbreakable encryption. It's just the reliance and the, strength of the encryption is relying upon how long it takes to break it, which also relies on 
what's the speed of the machine you're using. So all of those things, these are all part of emerging technologies and constantly presenting threat. We have also seen how so many organizations that fail to adopt these emerging technologies are basically out of the industry. I mean, now I'm going to pick on those of us that blockbuster defined their childhood. So yeah, you know, um, all of those things. Imagine like blockbuster was actually in the perfect position to be Netflix, right? But due to being too comfortable and not embracing this new technology thing and still sticking to, I guess, uh, cassette and CDs, where's Blockbuster today? All of those kind of things are around the emerging technology and the pressure is mounting constantly in these organizations to adapt to it, constantly changing. If you don't join it, you will be left behind. So as a risk professional, we constantly, constantly need to keep with the pace of at least technology, even if we don't keep pace on how to secure with the, te the technology. We do need to ensure we are constantly being up to date on what is coming into the market. Now that's a very hard thing to do. That's why as we continuously evolve even in our fields, we find our niche and just Focus on that. There are people that are very conversant in networking as such, they're able to tell you where the industry is headed. Some, it's AI, some, I don't know, you name it, right? Across the board. Personally, and this is really out of the class for me, I find really keeping up with these feature of work uh, documents, as well as reports that usually come out from lots of these um, organizations, especially these think tanks, their research or the congressional research and whatsoever, they tend to help me understand where the government sector is heading towards in terms of adoption, right? And then by knowing where the government sector is heading towards from adoption perspective, it allows me to know what risk might present itself in there. Even if I'm not able to articulate the risk because the trend is considered completely new, it does give that heads up of being able to identify like, hey, this is new to the point that we are unable to identify the risk, right? And that uncertainty in itself is a risk. Um, another thing I know is, but then at least one would say the private sector is really um, moves faster than the government, but I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. The next is around the industry trends. Now beyond the emerging technologies, we obviously have what is the trend within that industry you're playing in. Uh, I can tell you one, traditional banking now, if these banks, in as much as they are huge, even though they do not rely on only consumer banking around like having customers, but like these mega banks like Chase, Wells Fargo, whatsoever, they are slowly facing a trust from the fintechs. That's industry trend. I will be honest, the younger generation, they are not looking about into, yeah, Wells Fargo has been around for 100 years. They are looking up of, I'm sorry, they are looking for which bank has the best app that will allow me to instantly do my own little thing. Which bank is not going to charge me for overdraft? Which bank is not going to charge me for ATM? I love to travel a lot. Which one is going to give me points for actually spending my own money, right? Which one is going to give me some discount by using that? Um, instead of opening, I mean, maybe I'm just a college student instead of having it, so I don't have any direct deposit. So instead of having a traditional bank, you know, I'm just gonna go with cash app. I'm just gonna go with PayPal because it makes more sense to me than I don't know, Wells Fargo, who cares Wells Fargo? Who cares about JP Morgan, even though they have been the backbone of US for ages? I don't care about them because they are not going to give me $1 back if I go and spend my dollar at, at Subway. Like, I'm not kidding. That's the industry trend. So unless one is able to also look at the trend and make sure the organization is aligning with that or at least acknowledging and identifying other opportunities by responding to that trend, then truly there is a risk. Before you realize it, it begins to impact and then you're already late. I had this, 
I can't remember which CEO was it that was saying. I think it was Zuckerberg. We all know. Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, has found a way to build a toxic and bad reputation for himself, including Facebook, right? I believe if I'm to bring it up in this class, people will say like, yeah, I've been on Facebook for more than a year. I don't really use Facebook. I don't put my personal information. So obviously, but I think one thing that Zuckerberg touched upon when I was listening to him, now I disagree, but he was saying, irrespective of what it presents, irrespective of the, the toxicity that Facebook presents on whatsoever, the ability to stay relevant and keep up with the trend is really making a difference. And he was saying something about, he is the type of person that he rather, I think, I can't remember if it was a statement or someone attributed that to him. So please don't hold me on that. But someone was saying like, um, Zuckerberg is the type of person that he rather makes the mistake. And then no matter the consequences, so long as it allows him to, it allows Facebook to be relevant, that actually play it super safe. And guess what? It's actually a common trend within the entire tech industry. You look at IBM, they used to be very hot headed before they became dinosaurs. You look at Microsoft, some point, they were the ones constantly getting invited, constantly dealing with this privacy, constantly dealing with this, oh, very proprietary focus, not open sourced, right? If you know Microsoft history, it used to be that. Look at Amazon, they are now going through their own growing pains. Uh, Google, everybody who knows Google, they are facing their own things around, they pay well, they were server, but it, they basically turn you into living, eating, bathing, breathing within their campus, right? So all of those things, but they are still focused on the industry trends and it helps them stay, I guess, relevant. I don't know if I would say the same for IBM though, not on the general landscape of things. I feel like I'm picking on a lot of sectors here. All right, um, project management, uh, project and program management. I think this is, for anybody who is more on that managerial track, we can all relate to this. On clear and changing requirements, it's a risk. As I was saying earlier, one thing I realized within the government sector is if you expect things to be clear, a crisp clear with a perfect path, you're in for a surprise. But even very having that in place, I'm sorry? I said very much. Exactly. But at the same time, that, what, what does it present? A lot of issues, right? But it's the same thing we are also complaining. If we were to have the crypts clear, defined way of things, it becomes more of a checklist, the waterfall, right? So one response is maybe, I guess, embracing chaos. <laughs> but seriously, it's also around program <laughs> management. If the consultants, you, we can all relate to this. An agency puts out a, a proposal, it doesn't outline all the requirements, you respond to it, and then later on you have scope, uh, scope creep. Yeah, we actually wanted 12 virtual machines, not six. I mean, you guys replied, responded by saying like you deployed the VMs, you didn't specify how many as such, it's on you. Before you're realizing you now have, Deloitte consultants scratching their head and the partner, the senior manager, the manager going into the books and like, listen, where is the profit in this? Yeah, this is really chaotic. It's not the best way of things, but what's that? Scope creep. Uh, from defining the proposal, responding to it, again, project management, lack of budget. <laughs> I don't think we need to dwell into this. Uh, not my defense people though. Uh, lack of skilled resources. I'm not going to get political. I feel like I, there is a, a little bait in here that people want me to cling on. I'm not going to fall for it. Um, lack of skilled resources. Same thing. I'm not going to talk on this, especially on our that gov side. But there is a reason why we really cannot survive without those system integrators to do everything, right? Uh, honestly, you know what, I'm just gonna open the kind of worms here in terms of the lack of skill resources. We all know one or two people who really are the ISSO or the authorizing official or the whatsoever, and they basically don't even know anything about cloud. 
basically. I mean, I wouldn't say it's as bad as saying like it's a real cloud where someone will say, so what will happen if it rains? But um, there are a lot of them that do not know anything about the concept of deployment model, uh, models using cloud, those abstraction layers. But now they have the ATO package and uh, everything in front of them relating to cloud. As such, they don't even know where to start. That's an issue. Guess what happens? Chaos. Um, please go ahead, Harry, but please keep it short due to time. Please. Yes, sir, I'll keep it real short. So you, you talk about cloud, and I would say to you that uh, in the government, the other problem we have is uh, the service uh, perspective, right? Uh, that a lot of our project and program managers don't, don't have the uh, uh, knowledge on uh, the acquisition of services and that service management framework. So that's it. Thank you. 100% agree, hence why I tend to look into DFORS, especially around acquisition and all those service agreements and whatsoever, I 100% agree with you. You find, <laughs> you find um, a proposal that talks about nothing. You are consuming some cloud services, but it doesn't talk about anything SLA. What's the uptime? Are you gonna give us 99% or 1%? So yeah, 100% agree with you. So actually a point around program management, I think we should find a way to put that uh, failure to meet SLA and kind of those contractual agreements and things like that into this slide. But um, that will be for the next class, not this one. But yeah, appreciate your point, Harry. Uh, all of these nice points, they are all points that could present a risk. Moving on, lack of good project, uh, project management can lead to, you know, boss. <laughs> of competitive advantage. Why did I put that? No morale, it's absolutely true, especially if you have really energetic staff that are really driven and they like that challenge on your server, but uh, you're very, uh, I don't know, you like the skills, all of those things really can affect things. Testing, all of these things are basically impacts, right? So this is why and why and a good way. I think I should include DevSecOps here, but even though DevSecOps, it's more of a government side of things, uh, I guess I'm following the book. System development and IT project uh, support, right? We have like the SDLC, whatever is your poison, be it system or software development lifecycle, but comes in phases kind of that methodology on how we approach things from a program management as well as deployment and project and all of those things, right? You can see it from our DevOps perspective, you can see it from our DevSecOps, but they are all methodologies, right? Uh, spoke about Agile. If you don't know Agile, it's more of a program management concept, please, you can look into it. It's not really this, but it's definitely a program management thing. Waterfall uh, approach. So looking at its DLC, we all know the phases. If you do, if you do not know the phases, just, uh, I don't wanna say look it up, but it's consider a development life cycle. First, I'm not a big fan of using the word development, but I guess I'm not an authority to change that as such. Let's just take it as a life cycle. If we relate it to human beings, seriously, it's going to sound bad, but you know, our life cycle, you know, baby, holding battles, grow up, high school. Wait, why did I skip elementary and middle school? Anyway, elementary, middle, high school, college, work, vacations, you know, that life cycle, old age, uh, I don't know, joint pains, <laughs> all of those kind of things, it's the human life cycle, right? So now think of it from a project perspective. We initiate the project or even a software development. Initiate it, development or acquisition. If we're buying the software or building our own, uh, implementing it. The operation and maintenance, constantly tuning it up and disposal. Guess what? You can actually relate this to your vehicle. You can relate it to a lot of things. You buy your car. That's part of the initiation. You go to the dealership. You go back and forth. They tell you this, 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 they give you the good rock shade of the vehicle, you look at it, you see, my God, zero interest rate. This, 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 I got a deal. You leave and you don't know you're the one who has been turned into the sucker. I'm sorry. But yeah, um, all part of the initiation, now you buy it. That's more of a position since you're not the one building it. 
start using it, start implementing it. it, becomes crappy. Or rather, you constantly do your oil change, tune up. When it's a shiny new car, you really love it. Always justify taking it to the dealership for tune up. Starts becoming old, making some fancy sounds. Instead of going to BMW dealership, here you are going to Casco because the, car, the oil change is cheaper. And then you get to that point where like, you know what? Yeah, let's dispose this car. Same thing. <laughs> Is there anyone who didn't get this? I apologize. I know I'm being too um, silly with it, but truthfully, that's kind of it, the life cycle. All right, moving forward, the risk and control analysis, right? Someone was trying to say something? All right, moving on. What does that mean? Data analysis, cause and effect, we kind of touch upon this. We really touch upon this, but <clears throat> what is it? Just ways to identify the level of risk, right? But more relative to kind of um, what is acceptable to the organization, right? This is where risk practitioner, as a risk practitioner, you should be making your risk assessment by comparing the current state, as we mentioned, to like the risk uh, against, uh, sorry, I will say the current state of the risk, uh, including the control against what you want or rather what the organization objective is what is considered the desired state you take into consideration the effectiveness of controls so ways of doing that data analysis obviously which includes using data right could be generated data could be collected from logs whatsoever but still data we touch high level on, on it from cause and effective analysis the four, free fold analysis, sensitive analysis, all of those things. Interesting point here around threat and misuse case modeling. So every time you hear about threat modeling, it's looking into more of examining the threat, right? And the potential threat scenario, not necessarily the risk, but the threat. Keep in mind, threat is not equal to risk. I think everybody understand that now. If you do not, you and I, we need to take it one-on-one, -on -one. Um, but yeah. The threat modeling is actually looking into the threat itself and examining its nature, right? And what is the potential of, what potentials are related to, sorry, what scenarios are related to the threat, right? <clears throat> or at least can you come up? This is that part where we touch upon in the early chapter around, um, especially including those mindset approach. If you are dealing with like, say, an adversary, like a hacker or whatsoever, you're really looking at them, the other threat and looking in depth into that, them as individual. What could be the rational? What's, their, what's um, the reason behind it? Please, can everybody go on mute? Uh, what's the reason behind it? All of those things, right? That's part of threat modeling analysis. Uh, I know we are coming up on time, but to refer back to Stephanie's example, um, Earlier about the ransomware thing, at threat modeling, we really look into those adversary that stole those data. What, oh, actually it wasn't a ransomware. Uh, it was, I think, data theft, right? But um, it's really looking into what could be their motivation. Is the motivation to really have the information or is the motivation to get a little bit of pieces of those information similar to like Salani attack? Yeah gather little, little information from elsewhere and then make it a big deal elsewhere, right? And then make a meaning to it. So all of those things are around um, threat modeling. Root cause analysis is more towards diagnosis, right? To establish like, what is the origin of the event? And one thing I'm not a big fan of root cause analysis is also not a forward looking, but more like backwards. So something has already happened and now we're examining to see what is the cause of it? What's the origin, right? To, so you are now taking the consequences of what happened and really taking it back. The bad side of that is you, you weren't proactive into identifying those, but then the good side of it is it allows you to actually close it. Uh, rather respond to it so that it doesn't happen again. Gap analysis, I think we spoke about gap analysis, especially from that control perspective, right? Of looking at where the control should be, but where are you right now? And if there are gaps, closing it, right? Same thing with the risk. 
predicting risk, especially now it's coming, becoming um, uh, a common thing, especially around machine learning, AI, and all of those where we take previous incidents and apply machine learning and predict things. But yeah, uh, it could also be using historical content as we mentioned earlier, something uh, we can predict based on historical context, we can predict based on what we feel like the industry is heading towards, just like we just mentioned, the industry trend, and then really predict like, okay, the industry is now moving forward towards um, the use of phase, deep, is it deep fake? Or oh, I'm so sorry, like I keep forgetting this. I think deep phase or deep fake, but yeah. Deep fake. Okay, deep fakes. So the industry is, moving towards that. Now we will start looking, predicting what kind of risk can it present itself? Oh, we can see that. By the way, this is not my point. It's actually one of the things with deepfakes. Oh, we keep thinking like, huh, deepfakes could not be used to really target high profile people to say like they actually made this statement when they, re when they didn't, right? Politicians, it could be used to really damage people, uh, reputation whatsoever. That's all predicted risk because it hasn't happened. Then there's all that, that method of predicted risk based on it's already happened. We collect all the data. We pretty much put it into machine learning, AI, or if one has the intuition to be able to read something and then predict what's going to happen next based on that information that they have. So all of those could be predicted risk. Um, Harry, I see that you raised your hand. If you don't mind, I have three slides. I would really like to uh, see if I can make it. Uh, hit home with that as we uh, kind of uh, finalize. Then I'll give you the chance to talk. But yeah, um, so how do we analyze risk? We have two methodologies, or I would say actually three. Um, qualitative, quantitative, and that's semi-quantitative. Qualitative, just associate numbers with it, right? Be it monetary, whatsoever, just think of uh, quantifying risk from uh, a number perspective, sorry, analyze the risk from that quantity base of numbers, right? Then we have the qualitative, which is what we are going to do in this class. It's more of a range, could be a scale. Um, one thing though, a lot of people tend to think um, analyzing risk from a percentage perspective is more quantitative than qualitative. Actually, it is not because when you analyze it from a percentage perspective, even though you're saying 70%, it's more of a band where you're saying, okay, 70 is like the cutoff where it becomes very high or unacceptable as such, even though you're using percentage, it's not really quantitative. But yeah, um, looking at it from the qualitative, which is what we'll touch in this class, analyze risk the B, uh, from a BIA perspective based on qualitative analysis. So business impact analysis, in relation to NIST, or rather the US government approach uses a qualitative approach. So you hear things like FEDRAM low, FEDRAM high, FEDRAM uh, moderate, or NIST 853 low controls, or even within the DOD, IL4, IL5, IL6, all of these kind of things. These are all qualitative, right? We also have the semi-quantitative that uses a combination of both. Risk ranking. Again, just, I just mentioned like the risk analysis and the approach, but ranking them will be low, moderate, high and whatsoever. But we also have around the industry, it's not a new thing. We have things like around Octave, which is truly just an approach for risk assessment and then ranking those risk assessment, right? And it's usually used by a lot of organizations, government sector, no, but it's just, a risk assessment or ranking methodology, right? Octave is one of them. Um, you will have things like the risk appetite bands where I, I think this is self-explanatory, like the diagram from the higher the magnitude, the higher the frequency, then it really start become unacceptable because you have a risk that is going to cover a huge scope. And then the chances of that risk happening is basically high that the frequency, then absolutely no. But the risk could be high and the frequency may be very, very low to a point that is insignificant. So meaning if it were to happen, it's going to cover a lot of scope. Let's go back to Kali again, as I always say, people say that it's going to 
be on the water? What is the chances of it happening? Yeah, the frequency is very, very low. As such, then it's considered an opportunity, right? Meaning accept the risk. Um, actually not even accept it, go after it. <laughs> because truthfully in that angle, it presents you with an opportunity. That's what's considered, right? Especially if there is low magnitude, low frequency. That is the scope or rather the impact is really low, the likelihood of happening low as well. So octave is one methodology of how you um, uh, kind of um, evaluate that, right? We also have those risk appetite bands. There are many methodologies of this. That's the absolute truth. As I mentioned in this class, we are going to look at it from that um, qualitative approach based on business impact analysis. But um, yep, I guess from here, seriously, everybody should understand the need to have risk ownership. You will hear this a lot. This ownership and documented risk is something you will constantly hear because there's always, always need to document, document, document. Ta-da, this is the end of this slide. I know that um, for the last 15 minutes, I kind of, Took it a thousand miles, <laughs> going super fast. If it's a bit chaotic with you, for you, please, please, please let me know. And I'm happy to spend some time with you, even if it's via the phone, to kind of bring you up to speed. Um, I, again, this is on me. My uh, honestly, I will acknowledge it. It's, it's my inability to really do time management, which is also a risk. Uh, we are supposed to cover the third chapter this week. We have not, but I can assure you that you, we will basically finish this class on track by hitting everything. Nothing will be missing. However, if it means it's slowly becoming a bit chaotic for you because we presented this, hey, we are going to cover these chapters, but we are not hitting it. Please, please, please let me know because I would like to know how it is impacting you and then make sure I provide ways to accommodate you because this is on me. Um, Harry, you have the floor. Yeah, real quick, Professor. Uh, so so I, I was going to say, uh, just a reminder, we talked about that uh, collaboration channel. I know deep fakes, I know I have some information I got from a uh, khaki report on deep fakes, but uh, I was just going to comment to that that channel would help us, you know, uh, continue the collaboration. So that was my point. Uh, thank you, sir. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, we will create that. Both Dave and I, I believe, are taking action on it. But uh, absolutely, we will create that channel. I think it will be beneficial to all of us in the class to actually have that um, place where we are sharing these um, valuable information and resources we are gathering based on our experience and different places. So yes, we'll definitely try and do that. Thanks a lot, Harry, for the reminder. All right, uh, thank you. Shotan, any question? Any uh, one yet to figure out what security question or reports are? Oh, yes, sir, I, doctor. I have a question if you yeah, don't mind. So sorry, please. please. Just a second. Let me. Uh, so sorry on this. I will try as much as possible to make sure we have unlocked the modules before the next class to allow. Because I think this is we only have one module, and then everybody is kind of hitting a blocker. And we actually promised. Uh, to really be allow people to be flexible. As such, we will try and open everything before the next class. All right, sorry, go ahead. Yes, Dr. Wazir, if you don't mind, speaking of the chapter two quiz and chapter three quiz, are, are they recommended to be postponed and take them later until we, final, until we finalize the content to comprehend everything or we should take them now? <sighs> You're putting me on a third spot. Uh, because I do not want to say, yeah, postpone it, but then it's going to impact you in terms of scheduling. But I would say this, if one is not really conversant as much in this uh, area, again, I'm repeating it, it's a bit chaotic. As such, I would say, yes, I think you should at least push the quizzes to be after we have finished the chapter four of this, then you take all of it because it allows you to have an understanding of <clears throat> the end to end from chapter one to four. That way, even if you are taking the quiz for chapter one and you see something are related to assessment, which happened in chapter two, 
just because chapter one touched about it at a high level, at least you are done conversing on it. However, with that, please do not hold me to, I am the one who said, yeah, you can push it out as such. Now you have so much, you have the ATO, you have whatever, and you're unable to do the quizzes, you need an extension. We will be unable to give you that. So long as we are clear, I think that's it. Again, if you think it's super challenging, let's take it offline. Let's talk and I will see how I can help untangle those challenge. Happy to work with you to make sure you do it at the right time and also really meet it without an impact on you. Does that work? Thank you very much, Doc. Sure thing. Anyone, let me quickly see if there is any chat. Oh, there's I less chat. Yes, please. Sorry, um, what is the absolute deadline on the test, the quizzes? I'm sorry? What is the latest date we can turn in the quizzes? Uh, the quizzes, I think we have a defined deadline that is just applicable. Uh, I think it's the deadline that is on the syllabus is okay. the most accurate. And I believe we put those deadline because the next class we are going to review all the quiz questions. As such, everybody needs to take it first. Uh, so I will refer you back to the syllabus. Sorry, I'm being okay. lazy to open it myself. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Thank you. Bye-bye. Sure. Any additional question from anyone? If are there's like none, uh, multiple yeah. options or the like scenario yeah. based? You have to come up with your uh, ideas how to no, 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 analyze. No, 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 no. Well. Just pretty much multiple options, yes and no. No, I don't think there's nothing like drag and drop or whatever. Just multiple options and yes and no. But the questions could be scenario based and the responses will be available in the sense that it's meant to trick you. So do not go in expecting a question like, what is a risk register? But you can find a question that says something like, uh, let me see, a scenario base. Just take one scenario and apply it. And then you can see maybe some of the response will be around like, what is the best approach to handle this from a risk-based approach? And one option will say something like, aligning it with the business objectives. Don't need to say that. I think we all agree that will be a good option, a, a good option as part of it, but yeah. You said, you said next class we'll be practicing that or going over I'm that? Sorry? I'm sorry, what? You said next class we'll be going over that or practicing that? No, not next class. I'm saying like after the quizzes are due, all the quizzes, meaning we have passed the due date and it's closed, we are going to review all the questions because I can assure you this. There are people that will be pissed at us, Dave and I. Oh, it's all me, but they will take a part of it because there are people that will go through the quiz and say like, what the hell, this doesn't make sense. This is stupid, it doesn't make sense. Just this kind of experience. So we tend to kind of go over it, all the questions after everybody has submitted to provide that risk rationale. But not now, after the quiz has closed. Which should be around review time. Definitely before Thanksgiving, I think. I can't remember, honestly. It's on the syllabus. We won't know our answers until it's locked, right? I'm sorry? We won't know our answers were right or wrong until the exam yeah. is locked, correct? Yeah, you will not know your answers, whether they are right or wrong, until the quiz has ended. It only makes sense, especially for an online class, for you not to know it till everybody has done taking. Else I will start seeing it circulating in the group chat. <laughs> Any additional questions? I think a lot of people are concerned and worried about this quiz. I can tell you one thing. And do not take my, this explanation I'm about to give as an excuse to do bad, but I can tell you that it is not the end of things if you fumble. Meaning, if, you're, if you have done your best, Hit myself or Dave and let's explore additional opportunities for you to really get to where you want to go. We still need to put in the work, but you'll get what you want out of the class. I promise you that. Um, you will get whatever it is you want in the class. So I've seen seriously both scenarios where some have messed up in the quiz, but they do super well in the ATO because they are more hands-on and uh, it's more 
practical and I've seen other people who uh, do really well in the quiz and they come to that ATO thing. I can tell you who sucks at doing the hands-on thing. Those senior leadership in this class, I really enjoy putting them on the spot. I'm not kidding. Because it's, a, it's like a gotcha. You got to do it now. You know, you think you're a CISO. You go there and tell your ISS one, give them hell and tell them build an ATO package. Now you got to build it too. So. But yeah, any additional questions? Yes, Dr. Ibrahim, if you don't mind. Speaking sure, of the great, um, I, I'm just wondering, like, as for these news boards and security question reports, uh, mm -hmm. they are not being graded each week, right? They will be graded each week. We are supposed to grade them. I'll be honest with you. As of now, as of right now, I mean. No, no, none have been graded. Okay, got you. I, I I'm don't think so. Actually, hold on a second. I was Dave, wondering if that's only my case. Dave, Dave, any point on that as well on your part? I have not as yet, unless you'd like me to. Uh, no, don't worry. We'll work on it uh, together. Fine. But um, yes, I am absolutely certain we have not touched upon it yet. We will do. It's I'll on me. Sure. It's not rush, but I was wondering if, if, if I'm not being Trust graded, me. I'm the only one. Okay. It's totally fine. It's not a problem. I actually enjoy grading them earlier because it allows people to really have insight into where they are in the class. Um, I'll put in the time, it's just that uh, so much has been happening, but not an excuse. Or rather, not your problem, but we'll get it done. No problem. I have a Any question. Shazin, please. Um, I failed the test. <laughs> okay. And wanna talk about it in front of everybody, or you wanna take it one on one? No, that's fine. I'm, I'm not. You know, I'm not ashamed because I, I already knew <laughs> that when it comes down to testing, I, I suck at it. Okay. Um, but I actually did want to take the test to see how. Um, the test is so I know what to look forward to or what you know how much to study or what to do um, as far as in the test being five points is that like five points taken off of a hundred or mm -hmm. I think uh, okay. my grading approach is I'm not one of those process uh, did I just call myself a processor I'm not one of those <laughs> instructors that um, do like hundred points. I don't like the point thing. It's confusing. I just like one, uh, one means one, simple. Hundred means hundred. Uh, so yeah, five points means 5% of the grade. Again, reiterating this, I do not want people to let their early experience of the quizzes just because it tripped you a little bit. Don't let it set the tone for how your performance is in the class or don't let it demotivate you. Just keep us in the loop and uh, we work on it. Guess what? A lot of people, I hate tests. I'm not kidding. The irony in me giving people tests, but I hate anything standardized test. I just hate it. So I relate to that. Does it mean it's the end of life? Absolutely not. Just prove to me you understand the cont content in a different way and we'll work it out. Don't worry about that. So I'm um, happy to work with you basically. That's what I'm saying. Is that okay? Thank you. Jordan. Any additional question? Okay, if there are no more questions, this, has bring, uh, this is the end of the class for this week. And uh, we'll see you guys next week. Thank you so much. Uh, if you have, there, if anything comes up. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question for you. So go ahead. this week we have the, the security question due, right? The news mm -hmm. board due and also, so be the two quizzes, right? Chapter two and three as well. Okay. Uh, no, I think everybody keep asking the question on the quiz. Uh, please don't feel like I'm putting you on the spot, but I highly recommend everybody to go back and have a refresher on the syllabus. The quizzes are not due until a set date towards the end. I don't know if it's the end of the semester or mid-semester. November 9th before 6.30 p.m. Okay. Now the quizzes and the news, and don't think I'm just getting pissed or anything. No, 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 it's not. It's just like truly I'm identifying a need for the class to have a refresher on the syllabus. Yeah, I think it's good that the quiz should be taken before November 6th. Yes, that's yeah. absolutely true. But I would say still the security questions and news are weekly thing. Quizzes, 
thank you whoever said it is november 6th does that answer the question uh yeah like i said i i'm i messed up on the first quiz as well so <laughs> i'm just yeah that's the end of the line for you my friend <laughs> oh. that's it. you're on your own <laughs> just kidding we'll work it out okay okay any yeah. more question anyone none Thanks, Professor. Good night. Two, none, one, none. Okay. One go. more question, Doctor. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, cool. Go for it. Quick about the poll, like. Yes. For the class thing. Being realized, Thank or you. Um, I completely forgot to do that of this week, but I will say it's actually more of me being selfish because I travel. But um, <laughs> I would uh, put another um, oh my God, whatever it is, poll. Sorry, I'll put another poll for us to kind of see if we want to meet. And it like, I like seeing those responses. Ah, knowing if people want to stay in their pajamas all day. <laughs> all right. Um, thank you so much, everyone. Truly appreciate it. Uh, look forward to class next week. As always, feel free to send text, send a pigeon email, text message if you have any questions. All right? Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you doctor. Bye. All right, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.